When I was in college, there was this guy who many of my friends are friends with still, but whom I just kind of knew. I went to a really small college, so, you know, I sort of knew everyone, and you kind of knew maybe one or two facts about them, a few stories even if you didn't know them, know them. So this guy, who will remain nameless, this is the one story from college that I know about him, even though I don't really know him. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that even though I know this story, it might not be true. So. He drove this really small car. If I remember correctly, it was blue. And he would drive around the town we went to college in. It's a small town, rural in the Northeast, quiet, reasonably conservative. The kind of place where, while we were there, you could buy bullets at the local gas station. So the school we went to, the art school we went to, the art school we went to that was literally on top of a hill, we were definitely the weirdos in town. So anyway, this guy, he'd drive around this town in his tiny blue car, and he would listen to music really loudly. Which, in and of itself, isn't so weird. It wasn't uncommon to catch some metal or hip-hop or something blasting out of a lowered Civic or massive pickup truck or whatever. But this guy, he wasn't listening to Wu-Tang or Slipknot or Toby Keith. He was listening to this. This is a piece of music made by the composer James Tenney. It's called For Anne Rising, and it's 12 minutes long. The whole thing sounds roughly like this. It's comprised entirely of a shepherd tone, a sound which appears to be constantly rising, a sound which is an auditory illusion. That's what we're going to talk about during this episode of Reasonably Sound. Auditory illusions. Two of them, actually. In detail. So anyway, here we are, parked at a stoplight in this rural northeast town, and this tiny car comes rolling up, and out of it is emanating this vexing tone that always seems to go up. How does that work? Well, let's make one. You start with one tone going up let's say, an octave, over the course of a couple seconds. You fade it in at the beginning and out at the end. So this is one tone, starting at one note in one octave, with a glissando to the same note in another octave. A glissando is how you describe this type of movement, from one pitch to another pitch playing all the pitches in between. On something like a piano, a glissando is restricted to discrete notes. For instance, you can't play a note between B and C because there just isn't one on the keyboard. On something like a cello, or a trombone, or a slide whistle, or a synthesizer, like what we're doing here, there is no such limitation. Now, add a few more tones at different pitches and have them do the same thing. You can distribute the pitches however you want, but let's say you really like E minor chords. So this is a group of notes making a chord starting in one octave with a glissando to the same chord in another octave. Now what you do is you take this whole sound, chord fading in, glissando, and then out, and you copy it. So you have two of the exact same thing. Except... Instead of playing them one right after the other, you close the gap between them such that when one chord is fading out, the other one is fading in. Voila! Shepherd tone. Let's listen to it for just a little bit longer, just for effect. Okay, so, confession time. Technically speaking, this is not a shepherd tone, but a shepherd rise glissando. A shepherd tone is comprised of a set of notes all separated by octaves. So like the notes C4, C5, C6, and so on. You play them all at once, and that is a shepherd tone. 
What cognitive scientist Roger Shepard discovered in 1964 was that if you take a bunch of these tones, one made up of a bunch of C's, one made up of a bunch of C sharps, one of D's, one of D sharps, and so on and so forth, and you play them in a sequence, fading it in at the beginning of the sequence and out at the end, and then you overlap those sequences like we just did while making the Shepard Risse Glissando, you can't tell where the pattern begins and ends. It sounds like this. This is a shepherd scale, or a discrete shepherd scale, if you're into accuracy. It's made up of, you guessed it, shepherd tones. In the late 60s, electronic music composer Jean-Claude Risset took what Shepard described one step further and made the glissando version, which is what, in my experience at least, you hear much more frequently when people are describing shepherd tones and the related phenomena. And also, I actually just think it sounds a little cooler. But okay, how does this work? Well, if you really want to know, Shepard describes it all in a paper called Circularity in Judgments of Relative Pitch, published in the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America, volume 36, number 12, from December 1964, and it goes into way more detail than I will here, but I hope the following suffices. Essentially, our ears and brains can have a hard time telling notes exactly an octave away from one another apart, especially if those notes are in constant motion, if there is, for instance, a glissando. If, in the group of notes, we manage to pick out one note, we'd probably be able to tell that there are notes higher than it and notes lower than it. But if we listen to a Shepard Risse glissando and try to track the movement of a specific note to most people, to most ears, that specific note will eventually become hard to keep perfect track of. It just gets lost in the sonic weeds, so to speak. The way Shepard puts it is, all tones an octave apart would be mapped onto the same tone judgments of relative pitch should then become completely circular in the sense that there would be no highest or lowest tone in the set, but only an isotropic ring in which every tone has both a clockwise neighbor that is judged higher in pitch and a counterclockwise neighbor that is judged lower in pitch. Of course, if the shepherd tone is imperfectly rendered, and or you have a really good ear, if you pay close attention, you can hear the loop points for the overlapping glissandos. Here's a shepherd tone that I made using a guitar a couple years back for a friend's short film about a submarine crew trapped on their vessel. See if you can hear the loop point. Yeah? How'd you do? Did you manage to find it? If not, and you want to give it a longer listen, there's a six-minute version of this on Bandcamp. I'll put a link on infiniteguest.org forward slash reasonably hyphen sound. The next and last auditory illusion we're going to talk about is called a binaural beat. But before we talk about how illusion-y it is, we have to talk for a sec about something that's most definitely not an illusion. Something called, simply, a beat, with no binaural before it. Beats, sometimes called acoustical beats, work like this. Let's say you have two notes, and let's say those notes are near one another in pitch. Oh, and for clarity, again, we're going to use sine waves. So anyways, two notes near one another. No, no, even closer. 
No, 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 no. Even closer, like closer than two adjacent keys on the piano, a mere couple hertz difference from one another. Also, play them at the same time and let them sustain for a little longer. When two tones, or notes, which are very close to one another, are played at the same time, there's this fluctuation in the sound, a kind of wuh, 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 a bit of a tremolo effect. That is a beat. Anyone who has ever tuned an instrument knows beat frequencies intimately. As two notes get closer and closer together, as the frequency of one approaches the frequency of another, the beats produced get slower and slower, until they disappear. When there's no audible beating, the note is in tune. Conversely, as notes get further away from one another, the beats get faster and faster until it sort of disappears, and the two tones just become independently perceptible bits of audio information. Here's a quick sine wave example. There's a steady tone at A440, and then another tone, the frequency of which is moving up and down near A440. And just as a quick digression, acoustic beats are used compositionally to great effect by tons of composers, especially those interested in electronics and or microtonal music, meaning music written using notes between the standard set of notes used in Western music. One of my favorites is Alvin Lussier's Still and Moving Lines of Silence in Families of Hyperbolas, where beats are created by the interaction between acoustic instruments and sine waves. Here's an excerpt of the piece Xylophone from that series, performed by William Winant. Another favorite is Giacinto Scelsi's three-movement piece Yigur, which I must be mispronouncing. It's spelled Y-G-G-H-U-R and apparently means catharsis in Sanskrit. It's written for a single cello and notated using one stave per string, meaning Scelsi notated as though each string of a four-string cello are independent instruments interacting with one another. This is an excerpt from the third movement, titled, unsurprisingly, Catharsis. Okay, so, digression over. As fun and interesting as the existence and use of these beats is, we still haven't talked about how and why they happen. Well, so, when two frequencies meet each other in acoustic space, they mix. They add together to make whatever totality of sonic experience you're having. In the process of that mixing, interference can occur. That is what you're hearing when you hear beat frequencies interference. It's what happens when two or more sound sources produce opposing or non-complementary sonic material. For example, if you can picture two simultaneous sine waves, if one is at the peak in its wavelength while the other is simultaneously halfway between peak and trough, when added together in acoustic space, the aggregate sound will be the result of those two differing wavelengths put together interfering with one another. That is how beats occur. Except, and here is where we finally get to the illusion part, the two frequencies don't actually have to mix. They don't need to meet in the air and do their little sonic do -si do in order to create that wuh, wuh, wuh tremolo effect of beating frequencies. That'll happen all on its own, just in your brain. The illusion itself is called binaural beats, and it works like this. You put on headphones, and you play two different tones, one in each ear. 
Even though in this setup the two tones are not mixing in the air, creating acoustic interference, your brain creates that interference for you. How nice of your brain. It's thought that the part of your noggin that does this is the same part that helps you locate sounds in 3D space. However, we process directionality as it relates to the experience of sound. One side effect appears to be the creation of this psychoacoustic phenomenon. For those of you wearing headphones right now, here's an example. Two tones, one on each side. See? Or, I guess, hear? It's weird, right? It's not quite right to say that the interference, the beating created by the interaction between those two frequencies, isn't really there because you can hear it, clear as day. But it's definitely not there acoustically. Binaural beats have had all kinds of interesting and occasionally bizarre cognitive and even vaguely spiritual importance foisted upon them. They're involved in a process I've seen referred to as brainwave entrainment, where one attempts to reach a particular state of mind by encouraging their brain to mimic the brainwave type associated with it. For instance, deep relaxation is associated with theta waves, which have a frequency of around 7 hertz. The idea, then, is that if one were to play two tones such that a binaural beat of 7 hertz is produced, their brain will be entrained, or carried along by it. According to Wikipedia, so, you know, get at least a few grains of salt ready, Binaural beats have been used to treat addictions, uncover repressed memories, relieve anxiety, produce dopamine, and induce lucid dreaming. But based upon the small smattering of literature I've read, so, you know, more grains of salt just in the other direction this time, the actual provable effectiveness of binaural beats at addressing these things is still potentially illusory. My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at ReasonablySND, and you can find me pretty much everywhere at Mike Rugnetta. Mike Rugnetta.